Ladies and gentlemen, it's a, a great pleasure to be here, and I want to uh, thank Ken for uh, chairing this panel, and uh, Krista Muth and Yoram for the invitation to uh, appear today on behalf of the Edmund Burke Foundation. Um, I'm uh, here to address uh, nationalism, creed, and culture. That's the official title. What I really want to talk about uh, is one of the paradoxes uh, of a transnational movement for national conservatism, uh, which is in a way what uh, this conference is about. Uh, there, there's something in common uh, with many nations, if not every nation, that could make them candidates for combination with conservatism. But isn't it the case that when you um, uh, look at nationalism as an ism, you are tending to diminish the distinctiveness of each nation and of its own national traditions. So, for example, observers from St. John Crevecoeur to Tocqueville to James Bryce to Louis Hartz to Samuel Huntington have noted the unusual character of American political and social life compared to Europe's. Sam Huntington, who is one of the greatest American social scientists of the 20th century, noted the unusual character of, of what he called the, the creedal nature of American nationalism. And though Huntington was skeptical, like Yoram Hazoni is, of the adequacy of that creed for American cohesion, Huntington warned against confusing American nationalism, based in part on that creedal identity, with German nationalism or Russian nationalism or other continental varieties. So even as there is a, a certain risk in the idea of national conservatism, downplaying the creedal basis of Americanism and assimilating us to Europe, so there is the real and ongoing danger of European nations trying to unite into a United States of Europe and separately trying to reconstruct their societies into many Americas with large-scale immigration and a vigorous culture of victim groups clamoring for rights and benefits. Though such unwise imitation of America may be the sincerest form of flattery, it isn't meant as either flattery or imitation. It is done by Europeans, mostly, uh, in defeated or self-defeated empires out of guilt over their own former imperialism, as Josh was well saying. Um, these are empires that have collapsed the way a star collapses, pulling into themselves all sorts of the populations from the old empire and all sorts, all sorts of population from people who were never lucky enough to be in those empires but seek the prosperity uh, and civilization of the imperial core. Now, left-wing identity politics wants to persuade Americans that we too are an empire ruled by white males and guilty of racism, sexism, capitalism, and other founding crimes, though not yet, alas, from their point of view, brought low by this guilt uh, over these continuing and systemic transgressions. Identity politics wants to uproot both the citizen's pride and the immigrant's gratitude. But there's also a certain kind of right-wing identity politics, much more benign and in a way typically American. Uh, I mean not the MacGuffin of white nationalism, which is fortunately only a pathetic force, um, although I agree with Yoram that among the young it is a growing worry, but what I mean really is the kind of question posed by Samuel Huntington in his 2005 book, Who Are We? The title, Who Are We? The Challenges to America's National Identity. We too are interested in our identity as a nation. Yoram's uh, recent book on the virtues of nationalism is a, is, a, is a worthy successor volume in a way to Sam Huntington's study about this problem from 2005. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Huntington's argument and use it as a springboard for some further reflections on this problem of the relation between creed, 
what he called the American creed and culture. Now, Huntington, <clears throat> Huntington argued that our national identity crisis in America arises from three threats. The first one he called multiculturalism, which is a, certainly a, a close uh, first cousin to identity politics, probably marrying cousins. Um, uh, transnationalism is the second threat, and what he called the Hispanization of America was the third threat to American national identity. Hispaniz Hispanization means um, the presence of large flows of Hispanic immigrants from Mexico and Central America into the country, bringing with them the possibility of a Canada-like situation of a bilingual uh, country and a bicultural country. What are the sources of resistance to these threats? Huntington essentially saw two only in modern America. The first is what he called ideology or creed. And by that he means essentially the Declaration of Independence, the, the doctrine, the second paragraph of the Declaration, we're all created, all men are created equal, endowed by certain rights, uh, and natural rights, and the, the social contract, that, that famous uh, American document to which, in some way, all Americans uh, swear allegiance. And the other source of positive national identity is what he calls culture. Um, and by culture, he means language, religion, uh, and inherited, uh, certain inherited English notions of liberty. Now, who are we? This book was at bottom a defense of this culture, which he calls Anglo-Protestantism, as the dominant strain of America's national identity. Huntington never uh, rejected the creed, but he regarded it as fundamentally an offshoot of the culture. Um, the creed was a product of Anglo-Protestant culture, and this argument is very similar to the argument that uh, Yoram makes in his book on nationalism. To bring coherence and stability to American national identity, requires a creed firmly planted in the ground of Anglo-Protestant culture. The creed alone, Huntington thought, is too weak to hold America together. This is how he put it. Quote, America with only the creed as a basis of unity would soon evolve into a loose confederation of ethnic, racial, cultural, and political groups, unquote. He doesn't fear excessive individualism what he worries about is that individuals steering by the creed alone would be attracted to balkanizing group identities of one kind or another, and something like that is happening. Therefore, the creed must be subsumed under the culture if both creed and country are to survive. While agreeing with much of what Huntington says about the culture's importance, I want to speak up for the creed and for a third point of view, which is distinct from, I think, and encompasses both. Um, Huntington's account of culture, uh, this Anglo-Protestantism, is peculiar, narrowly focused on the English language and certain religious inheritances. Um, it, it's uh, imprecise about what exactly from Protestantism is our inheritance, because, of course, there are many Protestantisms, and there are many uh, inheritances, but he's on more solid ground when he impresses English concepts of the rule of law, responsibility of rulers, and the rights of individuals into the service of this Anglo-Protestant creed. Nevertheless, Huntington is left awkwardly to face the fact that his beloved country began almost with its first breath by renouncing and abominating certain salient features of English politics and English Protestantism. Namely, king, lords, commons, parliamentary supremacy, primogeniture and entail, the inheritance laws, and the established national church. There were, of course, many significant cultural continuities. Americans continued to speak English, uh, to drink tea, to hold jury trials before robed judges, and to read the King James Bible. But there has to be something wrong with an analysis of our national culture that literally leaves out the word American. Anglo-Protestantism, what's American about that exactly? The term would seem to embrace many things that our countrymen tried and gave up, 
and that have never been American at all, much less distinctively uh, so. Huntington tries to get around this difficulty by admitting that the creed has modified Anglo-Protestantism, but if that is so, how can the creed be derived from Anglo-Protestantism? When, where, how, and why does that crucial term American creep onto the stage uh, and into our souls? Now, multiculturalism likes to assert that all cultures are created equal and that America and the West have sinned a great sin by establishing white, Anglo-Saxon, Christian, heterosexual, patriarchal, capitalist culture as predominant. This is, from their point of view, a deplorable culture, irredeemable even. The problem with this argument is that it's self-contradictory. For if all cultures are created equal and if none is superior to any other, why not prefer your own? Thus Huntington's preference for Anglo-Protestantism is to that extent perfectly consistent with the claims of the multiculturalists. The only difference being that he likes the dominant culture and they dislike it. Of course, despite their protestations, multiculturalists don't actually believe that all cultures are created equal. With a clear conscience, they condemn and reject anti-multiculturalism, not to mention cultures that treat women, homosexuals, and the environment in ways that Western liberals cannot abide. So whether from the right or the left, the cultural approach uh, to national identity runs into problems. To know whether a culture is good or bad, healthy or unhealthy, liberating or oppressive, one has to look at it from outside or above the culture. Even to know when and where one culture ends and another begins, one has to have a certain um, distance from the culture itself. For example, is the culture of slavery or the culture of anti-slavery the truer expression of Americanism? Both are parts of our tradition. One needs some creed, it turns out, to make sense of culture itself. I mean creed not merely in the sense of things believed, but in the sense of moral principles or some genuine moral political knowledge. If that were impossible, if every point of view were merely relative to a culture, then you'd be caught in an infinite regress. No genuine knowledge independent of cultural conditioning would be possible, except of course for the very claim that there is no knowledge apart from the cultural, which claim has to be true across all cultures and times. But then genuine knowledge would be possible and culturalism would have refuted itself. So, one of the oddities of Huntington's argument is that the recourse to Anglo-Protestantism, which is a, a similar move that Yoram makes in his own book, is that, the re is that uh, from the academic point of view, it is less objectionable than you might think, but from the political viewpoint, less persuasive. As a scholar, Huntington figured that he couldn't endorse the American creed or its principles as true and good because that would be committing a value judgment. So he embeds them in a culture and attempts to prove uh, that this culture is useful for liberty, prosperity, and national unity should you happen to value any of those things. The Anglo-Protestantism that he celebrates, please note, is not exactly English Protestantism, but dissenting Protestantism, and not all dissenting Protestantism, but those parts that embraced religious liberty. In short, those parts that were most receptive to and shaped by the creed. As a political matter, Anglo-Protestantism is a hard sell, particularly to Catholics, Jews, Mexican-Americans, and many others who don't exactly see themselves in that picture. Huntington affirms repeatedly that his is, quote, an argument for the importance of Anglo-Protestant culture, not for the importance of Anglo-Protestant people, unquote. That is a very creedal, one might even say a very American way of putting his case for culture, turning it into a set of principles and habits that can be adopted by willing immigrants of almost any nation or race. This downplays much of what is usually meant by culture, however, and it's not clear what he gains by it. If that's all there is to it, why not just admit it's the creed or something close to the creed and approach the question of culture 
uh, through that uh, creed. Now, I promised a concluding third point of view that would uh, include both the proper role of creed and culture. And this point of view is what one might call the, the statesman's point of view, or the political point of view, in which creed and culture may be combined to shape a national identity and a common good. In fact, this can be illustrated from the American founding itself. In the 1760s and early 1770s, American citizens and statesmen tried out different arguments in criticism of the mother country's policies. Essentially, they appealed to one part of their political tr tradition to criticize another, invoking a version of the ancient constitution to criticize the new constitution of parliamentary supremacy, in effect, appealing not only to Lord Cook against John Locke, but to John Locke against John Locke. In the Declaration of Independence, the Americans appealed both to natural law and rights on the one hand, and to British constitutionalism on the other, but to the latter only insofar as it didn't contradict the former, natural justice. Thus, the American creed emerged from within, but also against the predominant culture. The revolution justified itself ultimately by an appeal to human nature, not to culture, and in the name of human nature and the American people and God as supreme creator, lawgiver, judge, and executive, the, revolu the revolutionary set out to form an American union with its own culture. Everyone recognized in the founding that certain qualities of mind and heart would be required of American citizens. If so, politics, they also more or less agreed, had to help shape a favoring culture. Most of the direct character formation, of course, would take place at the level of families, churches, state and local governments, and eventually um, public and private schools. In the decades that followed the founding, the relation between culture and creed fluctuated in accordance with shifting views about the requirements of the republic. Unable to forget the terrors of the French Revolution, for example, Federalists and Whigs, like Alexander Hamilton, Daniel Webster, and others, um, emphasized the creed's connection to pilgrim self-discipline and to British legal culture, the common law. This was perhaps the closest that America ever came to an actual politics of Burkeanism. Although the American Whigs never abandoned natural rights morality, they adorned it with the imposing drapery of reverence for cultural tradition and the rule of law. In many respects, in fact, Huntington's project, and perhaps Yoram's too, is a kind of return or recrudescence of liberalism. Now, uh, in conclusion, let me just say, modern liberalism, beginning in the progressive era, 20th century, 21st century liberalism, has done its best to strip natural rights and the Constitution out of the American creed. By emptying that creed of its proper content, thinkers and politicians like Woodrow Wilson prepared the creed to be filled by subsequent generations who could pour their contemporary values into it and thus keep it in tune with the times. This was Walter, the late Walter Burns' old formula, which I think is very good. It, originally, the idea was that you wanted to keep the times in tune with the Constitution. The progressive idea, the liberal idea, is the opposite, that you have to keep the Constitution in tune with the times. The living Constitution, as this new view came to be called, transformed the creed, once based on timeless or universal principles, into an evolving doctrine, turned it, in effect, into culture, which could be adjusted and reinterpreted in accordance with history's uh, imperative. Uh, alternatively, one could say that 20th century liberals turned their open-ended form of culturalism into a new American creed, the multicultural creed, which they have few scruples now about imposing on Republican America, diversity be damned. To his credit, Huntington abhorred that development. But I think his, his version of cultural conservatism is no match for his liberal opponents. He persisted in thinking of liberals, and I think Yoram is guilty of this too to some extent, 
He persisted in thinking of liberals as devotees of the old American creed who push its universal principles too far, who rely on reason to the exclusion of a strong national culture. But when liberals or progressives uh, renounced individualism and natural right decades ago, they broke with the American creed and did so proudly. When they abandoned nature as the ground of right, progressives broke as well with reason, understood as a natural capacity for seeking truth in favor of reason as a servant of will or culture or history, fate, and finally nothingness. In short, Huntington failed to grasp that our liberals attack American culture because they reject the American creed around which that culture has formed and developed from the very beginning. So what I've been arguing is that the American creed is the capstone of American national identity, but it requires a culture to sustain it. And our task as national conservatives or nationalist conservatives is to recognize the indispensability of the creed, but also the uh, absolute necessity of a uh, hospitable culture which combined with political wisdom can help to shape a people who can live up to its own principles. Thank you. <laughs>